Hi, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this morning, we shall be talking about FinSAC. And FinSAC has been a very important topic, but one which has received very minute attention by lots of Jamaicans. Jamaicans tend not to be critical of what happens in their financial sector. We tend to have this implicit faith and confidence in our governments that they are doing the best to give Jamaica some form of economic stability. We tend to believe um, that our Minister of Finance is doing his utmost best to put us on a trajectory of uh, prosperity. But that is often not the case. We must understand that Jamaica is a grand plantation and the system of plantation did not change. It is a systemic problem and something that has to be solved by the Jamaican people, not by the popul not by the politicians, because they are not interested in doing so. In fact, as I told you on many, as I've told you rather on many occasions, that our politicians are sent to office right, sent to their political office to protect the status quo and also to protect the financial interests of the minute economic class, that's economic elites, that live on Jamaican territory. Very important that we understand that. And that is why when Michael Manny spoke about the 21 families that controlled Jamaica, the financial elites were upset with him because they do not want to be unearthed. They do not want to be unmasked because their agenda is to keep the Jamaican population, the majority of the population, in ignorance and also in poverty. Because when their minds are unenlightened and their purses are empty, right, therefore they are controllable because they can be manipulated at every level. Now, what we have also is that our educational system, right up to the university level, is also controlled. So we have many people coming out of universities and they are not financially literate and they do not understand the history of economics and how Jamaica is currently at the position. You know, we think that, you know, the economic malaise that we find in Jamaica is primarily due to our politicians, right? And the fact that the PNP or the JLP and the PNP has a better antidote or the JLP, you know, um, gave us, you know, a much prosperous, a much more prosperous economy. And we tend to have our discussion so narrow that it is very difficult to really educate and to enlighten minds. And even within the diaspora, we find that our citizens who live in America, who live in uh, Canada and uh, also, you know, Great Britain, tend not to be well-educated in many, you know, in, in, in the broad sense of the term. They tend to think that having titles mean that they are educated, but they too are not really aware of the financial maneuverings, right? And the financial nuances that really um, bedevil the island of Jamaica, because we are almost like a laboratory as Haiti. And as a result of that, a lot of these economic policies, these disastrous, I must say, economic policies, Jamaica was used as a testing ground to see how far the global population, when these forces are implemented worldwide, how will they react? And I think that we have proven, Jamaica has proven that we are going to be submissive because we are submissive people, because again, it's due to a lack of education and a willingness to live in the dark. Remember now that Christ did say in his word that the greatest condemnation in the world this world has ever seen is that light has come into the world, but men prefer what? Darkness over light. They like to, they like to be in their own world, in their own little narrow world, and they think that that is what is the reality. But so often what we think is the reality is not the reality, and many of us are living in ignorance. Now, when we look at the at YouTube, for example, and let me share my screen briefly with you, and just to show you the videos here that is up on FinSAC, right? Um, FinSAC and many Jamaicans, particularly of my age and older, 
know about FinSAC, we understand that Dr. Omar Davis and Mr. P.J. Patterson, uh, the PNP government, presided over what is known as FinSAC, in which many, we saw the, the losses and the, the disappearance of many of our indigenous banks and also Jamaican businesses, right? And people are still suffering from that disastrous um, economic policy called FinSAC. Now, just let us look at a cursory look at FinSAC. Here we have on TVG, and this was produced four years ago. TVG FinSAC report. Let me um uh, let me put it here. Okay, FinSAC report delayed for too long, right? And this only garnered nine hundred and eighty views, right? And this was published four years ago. But if you talk about other things like nonsensical things about gossips and who's sleeping with whom, you are going to see lots of views, right? 20,000, 100,000 views. But that is not important to Jamaicans, right? Another one, JA senators argue over incomplete FinSAC report, right? And see news and this only garnered 280 views and it was produced eight years ago. This now, this is by a lady who is quite a very you know, renowned financial reporter in Jamaica. And she has here, well, she's on this program and it has garnered the analysis or the analysts rather, FinSAC sells stake in Simony, only 817 views. What's hot? FinSAC sells stake in Simony Group and that only garnered 351 views and so on. Look at this guy here, and, and these are, you know, entrepreneurs of Jamaica who actually, um, you know, they saw their businesses collapsed, right? Um, so there are victims of FinSAC, right? And slice of FinSAC, and that was published 13 years ago, 2.1K views, right? And the list goes on because Jamaicans tend not to be interested in things that matter. Here we have though um, breaking news, the FinSAC report to finally re to finally release, right? You know that this is not, this is just a lot of nonsense, right? Because even the title suggests that the FinSAC report to finally release. You know that this person is not just it's clickable, right? But it's not going to give you anything, any good information. But people tend to click on these things, 815 views, right? The people who are speaking and they are presenting, you know, content that matters, intelligent content, right? Jamaicans tend not to click on these things, right? But the ones that are unintelligent are receiving 100K views and 60K views and all of that. Somebody told me the other day that they're not going to subscribe to me because I'm not telling the, the full story. And I'm asking, who is telling the full story? But what Jamaicans like to listen to is really gossips, right? They just like to hear what we're sleeping with whom and, you know, and these little matters that are not going to help us to grow, right, and our economy to grow and for Jamaica to be transformed into a prosperous economy. This is where we are at. But let's begin with the whole matter of FinSAC. Now, there was an editorial from the, the, um, the Jamaica newspaper, that's the Jamaica Observer. And let me see what the editorial is saying here. The title of the editorial is FinSAC Experience, a Nightmare Still Ongoing. And this was actually written on March 14th, 2024. So let us let me share that story with you, that editorial with you from the Jamaica Observer, so that you can see that these are not my sentiments, right? But these are coming from the Jamaica Observer. And notice that the Jamaica Observer tends to lean towards the GLP, right? So here we see um, Nigel Clark, the Minister of Finance. As is often said, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. That is how the editorial opens up. For that reason, we take great interest in Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark's announcement of plans to finally publish all information relative to the unfinished FinSAC Commission report. For the very young, it's probably very difficult to get a grip on Jamaica's financial sector collapse of the 1990s, right? And I think that Jamaicans 
have looked to educate themselves about that financial collapse, right? Because we were used as, uh, as, as um, you know, uh, as a laboratory, right? As guinea pigs, as it were. To put it very mildly, that event was, as Dr. Clark describes it, a defining period of the Jamaican story. By the way, I understand that Dr. Clark is going to release it to people who are going to make a documentary about it. So I'm not sure it's going to be released to the public. I think it's going to be released to people who are desirous of making documentaries that they can make some money. So Dr. Clark is just an actor here, right? He's not serious about releasing that document. So just be aware, right, of that. It was a time when a number of thriving Jamaican-owned banks, near banks, insurance, co insurance companies, and numerous businesses, including exporters, collapsed under the weight of astronomically high interest rates and soaring debt. Many well-off Jamaicans were wiped out, losing their businesses, and in some cases, their homes, which had been mortgaged as risking or risk-taking entrepreneurs pushed to stay afloat. The People's National Party government of the day came under strong and sustained attack, not just from the then opposition Jamaican leader Labour Party, but from business leaders for what was described as inept policy direction. But the fact of the matter is that they both benefited from the Jamaican Labour Party and also from the People's National Party. So let's be clear on that. You know, so the Jamaican observer can try to be as partisan as they want to be, but people who are knowledgeable understand, and people who are non-partisan like myself, they understand that both members from both um, sections of the political aisle did benefit from this disastrous policy, or those disastrous policies, I should say. Dr. Clark told Parliament and the nation on Tuesday that the financial crisis led to a rapid build-up in our debt ratio and had the effect of obliterating opportunity as interest costs consumed national resources, right? And the editor goes on. Now, we have 15 years ago, the Bruce Golding led GLP government appointed a commission of inquiry into what caused Jamaica's financial crash of the 1990s and the surrounding circumstances. We can call Jamaica the country of commissions of inquiry, right? We have had loads of these commissions of inquiry. And what have they done? What, what solutions have they really presented or advanced? None, right? We have never benefited. My understanding is that they actually invested over $150 million into this um, FinSAC Commission of Inquiry. So that is something interesting, and it could be more, because we never tell the truth, right? It could be more than $150 million and you know, of taxpayers' money. And a lot of times, these only benefit the elites, right? Those lawyers and the, and that, and these economists and all of that stuff. Jamaica, the order of Jamaica or Jamaicans will not benefit from this sort or these sort of inquiries, right? So just to make, just to set the facts, just to make that point clear, I should say. Dr. Clark tells us that material to be released the, uh, in due course consists of contributions from then government officials, economists, academics, former leaders of failed financial institutions, customers of those institutions, including those who found themselves with ballooning debts, among other stakeholders. We agree that we owe to, to the victims of the era, to ourselves and to future generations, to record for posterity the evidence gathered and to make it public, right? That is what Dr. Clark is saying. But can we ever believe what Dr. Clark says? As business leader Dr. Oliver Jones said in his foreword to a painful book, Too Black to Succeed, the FinSAC experience written by a victim, Miss Valerie Dixon, the FinSAC experience is not a nightmare from which one will wake up. Indeed, there are real victims who hurt and in some cases are maimed for life. Right? Beyond that, Jamaicans need to get a better understanding of what really happened so that the errors, whatever they were, made by whomever, are never repeated, right? They always say that, that the errors in the pandemic, that we need to get a grip on what happened, right? As if a lot of what happened, right, was not deliberate, 
right? We do we know that a lot of what happened, right, were deliberate um, attempts to set the economy backward on a backward path, right? We understand that. Those of us who like to be tethered to the truth, right, and are not right averse to truth speaking, we understand that it was a deliberate attempt to get the more, what you call it now, the, the wealthier, right? People, wealth, more wealth, right? And to impoverish the masses of Jamaicans. It's time for us to come to grips with these very unfortunate facts and realities. They are unfortunate and they're sad, but it is true, right? And we've got to accept truth, even though it is painful. And that is one of the things that I find that Jamaicans do not like. We do not like truth, right? And if it has to do with our friends, it has to do with our families, it has to do with our father or mother, we do not like to accept truth. And truth can be painful, you know, but we have to learn to accept it, right? Because it is truth. Because if we don't, then we are not going to grow Right? You're not going to grow intellectually if you continue to resist truth. And that is why we have a dearth of intellectual scholarship right, in Jamaica because people are adverse to truth. Right, We just don't like truth. I'm not sure why, as a country, we just like to embrace falsehoods because it makes it, you know, it, 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 it enlarges our ego and make us feel proud to be Jamaicans, right? And we lick up what we tell our, and all of this nonsense that we tell ourselves. But I think that we should be writing books now, the lies our governments have told us, or the lies that successive governments have told us, right? That is something that should be a very interesting read. Now, there is another article that was written by, before we go into this article, let, let us look at, listen to some of the experiences of FinSAC, right, on YouTube. I'm going to have you, I'm going to pause a while and have you listen to this gentleman here that is Godfrey Dyer. And he gave his, um, his experience, right, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, and he was victim of the disastrous policies of in fact, so let me share my screen with you and you shall listen to him and learn right? and see from what this character, this entrepreneur has to say, because his experience is rather very, very enlightening. And it, 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 it captures, it encompasses in a nutshell what really took place. You can learn. And those of you who are, very, are younger than I am and perhaps you were born after the 1990s, then you could learn something. He has a lot to say in very, very short space and short time. So let me um, have you listen to him. Could you? Same. Uh, projection, I should be out for seven years, three months after completion of the project, the interest rates are moving up. By 2006, it peaked at 75% plus 35% penalty. That's 110%. There's no way we could pay. By 2007, I think it was early 2008, they decided to, to take over the hotel, which was the Bangladesh Department CD. They said I was owing 147 million. By then I had paid 47 million. So I paid 47 million by 2008 and was owing 147 million coming from $15 million. They took the hotel. Um, I filed uh, a thing in court and decided to buy it. Yeah. Uh, nine, I'm sorry, not 2000. Uh, 
92. Yes, 90. Thanks for that for the correction. It looks like this, but it is. And it's big by 1996. And 1998, they took the hotel into receivership. I find an option important to sacrifice. It took about a year. We, we had about three hearings until the court said the bank should show how they arrived at that amount. Of course, the bank wouldn't show it. They wouldn't show it. And it kept delaying. And my lawyer started fighting and asked for answer until they decided. By then, no, they turned it over to the, the uh, Pinsack. And Pinsack was now uh, handling it. They called me and said, let us come. But we started talking. The car they couldn't they couldn't show how they arrived, but I paid 47 million and still weighing 147 million. We negotiated, negotiated, and go get to it very quickly. We settled it at the, the converged into US dollar. And we settled on a balance of 1.8 million US. So I took over back the hotel from them, going them. 1.8 million US. Um, and got five years to pay that. No more interest will be added. Interest will be grown. The bottom line is, I finished paying them 2006. By the time I finished, I had paid a total of 150 million for that 15 million dollars. That's how it was settled. Jamaica dollars now, Jamaica dollars. I, I felt that if the government had stepped in with pizza, if they had gone to these individual owners, and I me, mean, for instance, have been borrowed 15 million, if they had come to me and said, look, we know the circumstance, high interest rate, whatever, let us negotiate a set amount and refinance, I think 9% of the borrowers would have their properties today. 90% would. But no, they took it from us. And I was one I lucky one to negotiate and get back because I thought it was important. But many other people who had reached that stage lost their property. And they, they, they heard from talk about it. They took it gave it to the redevelopment and up to now I'm not sure it's determined whether it's 10 cents, 20 cents or 30 cents. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But they would not settle with us even for 30 cents in the day, even for 50 cents in the dollar. And they, and they took it and gave it to me. I think it's really gradual. I think the, the results of this inquiry needs to be known because it's the only way we are going to ensure that this does not happen again. I agree. Wow. That is... That is interesting, right? An interesting phenomenon that, or phenomenon that took place in... Wow, what's going on here? Okay, are you hearing me? Hello? Okay, yeah, that was an interesting phenomenon that happened in, in Jamaica. Now, the fact that he borrowed 15 million Jamaican dollars, right? That is what he borrowed in the 1990s. Was it 92, he said, right? And the fact that he, in 2006, when he decided, when he ultimately paid off that loan, he had to pay 150 million Jamaican dollars. Suggests that he paid, what, 10 times the amount that he borrowed. Now, that 
is a cruel and wicked society, right? There is absolutely no other way to express that we are wicked people. And that policy was evil, right? And it was a policy that should not have seen the light of day. And you really wonder how people like Mr. P.J. Patterson and Dr. Omar Davis, how do they sleep when they remember the policies that they implemented, the, the, the catastrophic policies? Because this was catastrophic in every sense of the word, right? It destroyed the physical, economic, spiritual, and all aspects of the victims lives right and we still have not yet heard the full story but that was you know in a nutshell it it, it it encapsulated his his testimony encapsulated in a nutshell what really took place and many people had to pay over 10 times and you know loads of money or they had their assets forfeited Right and taken away from them, and a lot of times given to these elites. Now, what he was intimating was something interesting: that the 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 the, the financiers, the the entrepreneurs, the Jamaican entrepreneurs, that they were willing to take over the debt, to buy the debt from the Jamaican government for thirty fifty cents, right? And if, I think it was sold. You know, the government sold the debt to a foreign country, a foreign entity, a foreign person, foreign company, right? For five cents. Think about that, that the people were willing to buy the debt for 30 cents, 50 cents, I think he was saying. And it, it has been proven by Valerie Dixon, who has written the book, Too Black to Succeed. And as I talk about Too Black to Succeed, it's very, very important that we understand and I'm going to look at the the uh an article here. Give me a second. I'm having a little problem here with this computer. Um, let me see if I can pull it up another way. Okay, all right. So we have here. Let's go to the article. Um, let me see if I can close this here and go to the article. And this was written by I think. Um. No, this is not the article I was looking for. Yeah, Lloyd B. Smith, right, who wrote this article. Now, was it yesterday? Somebody sent me a video um, that was about Jamaica and the fact that, you know, they were alleging in the video, I'm not sure that Mr. Well, Mr. Honus would have made such a statement, but, you know, that was not the video. It says, uh, you know, um, that Black people are not that smart right or not intelligent because we have all these chinese people coming down and from the chinese perhaps were saying that black people are the stupidest or some of the you know, the, 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 the people without sense you know they, they they are not sensible people right um the most backward people that we have in the world the most backward race because what we find in in Jamaica, we find the Chinese have gone down there and they have taken over the shops and just about everything that is in Jamaica. The China are Chinese owned at the moment, right? So we are colonized, as it were, by the Chinese, right? And Jamaicans have no problems about that. They don't have no problems with that. They think that they can be a prosperous economy. Just allow Doctor Clark to do his voodoo economics. Right and practice his neoliberal and um neocolonial uh what should I say now theories you know and implement these neocolonial and neoliberal policies and Jamaica will overnight be a prosperous economy. Many people think that, including people with PhDs, they haven't got a sense of what they're talking about. Neither does Dr. Clark, right? But let us look at what Lloyd B. Smith had to say here, um, based on what I've just said about, you know, the Chinese owning businesses in Jamaica. He says here, do black, the, the title of his article is Do Black Family Businesses. Let me push this here. Do black family businesses matter in the Jamaican economy? Right? That is what 
the article. This is the title of the article. Many years ago, an aging black Jamaican businessman in Montego Bay, St. James, complained to me that he was having tremendous difficulty getting any of his grown children to fully integrate themselves in his business. He lamented the fact that the only time he saw any of them was when they came to raid the till in order to go sporting. Because that is what black people are about. We like the sport and you know, and we do not like to take life seriously. And that is how we have been grown up. That is how we have been acculturated. And parents take stock. You've got to grow your children up to be productive citizens. Stop spoiling them and thinking that they just need to go to sports games and they, everything is entertainment. They need to learn how to be productive citizens, right? Remember now that they're not going to be with you for long. 18 years and they're out. Right. And those 18 years go by very quickly. And many of our parents think that the 10 year olds or even seven year olds are still young children. They're not. Right. You need to ensure that they grow up as quickly as possible, not to give them adult responsibilities, but they ought to bear some responsibilities in order to become productive citizens. Very important that you understand that. He then pointed out that across the street from his business place. Now listen to the, look at the contrast between the Chinese and Jamaicans. Mr. Chin's two children, a boy and a girl, were busy assisting in various ways, from wrapping saltfish to weighing flour and when necessary, sweeping the floor. So these children did not consider these chores to be inferior, right? Of inferior stock, right? They believed that they were helping to grow their business that they are going to eventually take over after their parents have either died or you know migrated, whatever they're doing. But that business is going to be um, bequeathed to them. They understand that from a young age. Jamaicans, however, do not understand that because to sweep the floor to them would be something that is an inferior activity, right? How many Jamaican parents don't allow their children to do chores at home, to wash the dishes, to clean, to mop, right? Or to, to vacuum. Do you allow your children, seven-year-olds, to do these things at home, to allow them to understand that they can't allow you and you, you know the adults to do everything, but children also need to play a pivotal role in the lives of the home, right? Or whatever business that you might be operating. One of the most admirable qualities of the late Gordon Wood Stewart, business icon and philanthropist the extraordinaire, was the deliberate way in which he built a family in power which now sees his son, Adam, as the man in charge. Indeed, it is no secret that when one examines the Jamaican socioeconomic landscape, there is a predominance of family-owned businesses operated by every other race except sufficient numbers of blacks. Right? This is what Mr. Lloyd B. Smith is saying. Something is wrong with that. And I think that system, that sort of mentality, right, was, um, should I say now, it, it, it was cemented in the decade of the 1990s, right? That was when it was cemented with this FinSAC debacle. And the fact that Jamaican businesses predominantly owned by Black people, were just snuffed out. The, the, the lives of those businesses were just snuffed out because of Dr. Omar Davis's and Mr. P.J. Patterson's policies, policies that they implemented. And Mr. Patterson should have known better as this Black man, right, who was making these grandiose speeches and using soaring rhetoric to deceive the Jamaican population as they like to be deceived, because guess what? He is this very important elder statesman, right? And you respect him, even when he's actually um, in, in implementing policies that go against the health and wealth of the Jamaican economy, right? Something that you must understand, and we've got to come to grips with, and we've got to teach our children and grandchildren about this history that it was a catastrophic time in Jamaica. And I think that FinSAC 
continued and has been continuing. I don't think Pinsack ended. I think that our economy is still being raped by the policies that we are implementing. And I find it very interesting that the, we said bye-bye, according to Mr. Patterson, ta-ta, right, to the IMF in 1995, and then we were FinSacked afterwards, right? We had all these banks being closed, right? And, and we're talking about indigenous banks, right? And businesses being closed, even though we had said goodbye to the IMF. I want to think that the IMF was a part of this and, you know, ways in which we can't really verify, right? But something was amiss here. And after having done that, and right, and, and the, the whole FinSAC, probably phase one had been completed in 2006. And then we had the IMF, you know, the whole world financial meltdown in 2008. And we, you know, we were back in the, in the clause, as it were, of the IMF in 2009. <laughs> how interesting, right? How interesting and how coincidental. Hmm? What coincidence? And but you know, lots of things that happen in Jamaica are just mere coincidence, right? They're just they just happen out of, you know, you know, nothing. There's no conspiracy behind what happens. Just it just happened because it's natural. That's how things work, right? Jamaicans are meant to be poor and hapless and ignorant people. Right, that is how we should be. Right, that is how the system is set up. That is how it is designed, Andrew. So don't think about the fact that there are things happening behind the scenes that would have impinged on us being that poor, hapless, and illiterate society. Right, it's just the way how things are set up, and we should just go our merry ways and be happy. Right, and watch all you see in bold, and you know. And, just drink some wine and have a merry time, right? Because that is what it is all about. Now, the there's another lady here, and her name is Yola Gray Baker. And I think she gave a rather powerful speech, right, in her deliberations about what happened during the 1990s in the Pinsack debacle, right? And this was published some 13 years ago. Right, but I think that we should end this discussion with her speech. It was potent, right? And it is a relevant speech. And it's something that all Jamaicans should really try to understand and try to digest. All right. So let us listen to Miss Viola Baker as she deliberates here. Presentation. Made suggestions that um, the fixed assets, the assets that are held by fixed assets, and I guess Jared was to be taken back and uh, given to the NHB. I do not know, I don't have any idea how he plans to do this. All I know is that these assets belong to someone else then some arrangement would have to be made as far as the borrowers are concerned. Um, this is a meeting that should have been made with the borrowers from before the inquiry even started. And then Dr. Davis's suggestion to reopen the inquiry so Mr. Shaw could commit to testify. You know, I'm sick, I, I figured that I said to myself, I was incensed that Dr. Davis would be making light of such a serious situation. And and as if it is funny, I take I take exception to him behaving the way that he behaved. Okay. That, that is so to me that was so distasteful. You know, but and David had that. Now, in as much as Mr. Shaw, when I read what Mr. Shaw actually was suggesting, I don't get the feel of genuine concern for the cost the borrow. And I use the word borrow because the entire report would show that not all the properties handed over to FinSAC and to Jamaica Redevelopment were for outstanding loans. 
to the affected persons, some of them were not debtors and not, of course, not bad debtors as Dr. Davis had referred to them. Their titles were illegally used to acquire loans, unknown to them. Mr. Witt, Mr. Michelle Willis, who is here, he is one of the persons who the loan was taken on his title that he knew nothing about. We, the entrepreneurs, who devoted our time, resources, and a passion to improve the quality of life for ourselves and for all Jamaicans, served our country unselfishly, were destroyed by policies from the Ministry of Finance back then, and robbed of our properties and assets illegally. Properties that we earned with honesty, integrity, blood, sweat, and tears, while visionless, lazy, and corrupt perpetrators who sit in our parliament with little or no insight or skill to attract investment to rebuild Jamaica's economy, continue to steal what they didn't work for or earn. Why is it they cannot come up with at least one solid prospective investment opportunity to show to the island? Why are there not enough investable businesses in Jamaica now? Things that destroyed them. Mm -hmm. When did Jamaica start depending on outside investors? FinSAC destroyed our own investors. Our entrepreneurs, the members of our entrepreneurs of ours from our association have long passed the point of believing that any of our governing bodies has the interest of the people at heart. Yes. Of course, we appreciate the fact that Mr. Shaw made every effort and accomplished having the inquiry take place. But how better off are we now? For it? When a family member looks at a note from a suicide victim that reads, I cannot go on one more day with the noose of things that around my neck because he's unable to provide food for his family. His years of suffering, he cannot see the light of the end of the tunnel. And this is what Dr. Omar Davis finds funny. Mr. Shaw knows full well that no one in the People's National Party administration has any intention of allowing the entire report to see the light of day. So let's not talk about integrity and sense of decency. There is no Jamaican politician that I can put an integrity or decency label on. H.W. Longfellow wants to explain the justice mills of God and time seem to grind slow, but they grind exceedingly fine and with exactness grind pure. So in the end, he uphold justice and then he would judge correctly. Jamaica, my friends, is in bondage. He needs a compelling directive that would revolutionize the entire country. The law of principle and love is lacking. We are caught in an evil vortex of corruption and crime. There are three instances in biblical times in which Jamaica can be compared right now. When Abraham pleaded with God to withhold his hand of judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah, but when God couldn't find five righteous to Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed it because their evil was so great. Can he find five righteous in Jamaica? Again, when Jesus went inside the house of Zacchaeus, the crowd outside grumbled because Jesus was a guest with a man who was a sinner. But when he came out, he announced that this man is now the son of Abraham. Luke 19, 1 to 9. That he has recognized his own depravity. He repented, turned from his wicked ways. 
he confessed that he would restore fourfold yes. of anything that he had stolen from anyone. Jamaican politicians helped themselves at the expense of ordinary people. The conspiracy, robbery, corruption, injustice, bribery, and lawlessness continues. The Lord has set a snare for them. Those who plow iniquity and plan trouble will reap the same. The time, the circumstances, and the moment require that we step out of our partisan bumpers and state the facts as they exist. Recognize that there are solutions and have the courage of our conviction to really put the controversy. If we look back at the great famine that came on the land in the days of King David, 2 Samuel chapter 21, this famine came because King Saul had wickedly breached the covenant that the children of Israel had made with the Gibeonites. So God's hand was lifted up high concerning this matter. But the truth is, God had shown grace for many years as he waited for the leaders to rectify this wrong. The leaders did not straighten out the injustices. So God, who is just and keepeth the path of justice, brought the famine on the land. King David, who was God fearing, was not able to see why God's hand was lifted high. So he sought the Lord, and the Lord revealed to him the breach of the contract with the Gibeonites. God basically said, You have wronged the Gibeonites, and I have taken up their case because you will not give them justice. So give justice before I will give you relief. This is where Jamaica is now. They may get a zillion dollars of IMF loans. Jamaica will never prosper. It will continue down the current slippery slope with disaster after disaster that will not stop until our leaders recognize their evil ways and surrender this country back to God. Peter Bunting somehow probably recognizes this, and probably he needs to be the one to start the course of repentance. But my brothers and sisters, hold on to your faith in Almighty God. Justice will not be denied us. I know that for sure. There are plans ahead, and he guides our every action. Thank you. Very good and very well said by Miss Yola Bacon. I can't, there's nothing more to add to what she has said because she's right. And there is indeed a conspiracy to keep Jamaican Black people in their space, right? And to ensure that they do rise up and become successful and productive citizens. Same conspiracy that we see happening in Haiti as we speak. These two countries, the two most revolutionary countries in the hemisphere, particularly during slavery. And you have Professor Orlando Patterson, who has always said, and he has said this, and he said that he does not mean to um, belittle the Haitian revolution, but what he's saying is that our revolution started with the Maroons. So we tend to look at the Haitian Revolution as the revolution that sparked freedom within um, this region, but it, it's really the, the rules that, that fought against the British. So Jamaica has this revolutionary spirit within them. Um, I am not sure after independence, uh, perhaps after an em emancipation, if we've lost that emancipatory spirit, if we have lost that spirit of freedom, and I perhaps too, the education system has so indoctrinated us that we have become submissive and we've become more idiotic than we ought to be or we ought to have been. Because there's no education like self-knowledge and reading for yourself, teaching yourself, being self-taught is one of the most important things. And I think we have to unlearn a lot of the things that we think we know that we do not know. Right, And that is going to be the challenge of today. Some of us are so much tethered to these ideologies and these human theoretical frameworks that we fail to understand 
the realities that bedevil us, that plague modern Jamaica. And I think that, as she suggests, we can receive all the money from the IMF, even if they were not giving, even if they were offering those loans at lower interest rates. We're not going to prosper because we are a wicked society. What we have done to our people, our own people, right? And then we talk about dual citizenship and all that nonsense. And we have had people who look like us, who black like jet like myself, as black as I am, right? Who have destroyed their fellow black people. Where are we going? Where do we think we are going with that sort of mentality? And with that adoration of people like with people like Mr. Patterson's and you know and the Goldings and all of these prime ministers that we've had, where are we going? Do we think that the Mark Goldings or the Andrew Holnesses of, of the world are going to save us from this predicament that we find ourselves in? And notice she said, and let me end the video here because we can't go longer than this. One of the things that he said is that people's names were falsely used to, to get loans. So let us say you you know, I had a loan on, on the books. And then there's a, let us say I had it for 150 million. And then next I see another 200 million that I didn't sign off for, right, on attached to my name. Now, how did that happen? Now, we are living in this global village where our information is out there. The banks have shared our information with all these people, you know, all these financial centers, right? And we can get up one of these days, one of these mornings and see loans and debt attached to our names that we know that we did not owe. How are we going to defend ourselves in this global village when we have shared our information with everybody on earth. And even if we did not directly share it with them, the banks and all of these entities, right, have shared our names or information or addresses with all of these people out there, all right? And we talk about Jamaica and scamming. This was perhaps, the FinSAC was one of the greatest scams that I've, that I've, you know, that, that, that I've ever come out of Jamaica, right? And Evidently, it did not come from the lower class. It came from the upper echelon, including our governments. Something that you have to understand that our governments perhaps are the greatest scammers in the world. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and share and subscribe. Now, remember now that you have to like the videos for the videos to be shared. If you don't like the videos, the videos won't be shared on. And YouTube is very, very clear on that, right? They have been showing me and other people that if the videos are not liked, if they do not receive sufficient likes, they will not push the video. So as soon as you um open the video or about to end it, please put a like on the video so the videos can be shared. It's not just that the, the videos are sent out to people and they're going to watch them. It doesn't have to work like that. If the videos are not liked, they just remain there and they will not be dispatched so other people can view them. So please be unselfish and share the videos. I have put the time and the effort and the thinking into putting this video together. So it's very easy for you to just click the like button. Doesn't cost you anything. Thank you so much. All the best to you. See you in another video.